My mind is open. My heart is ready. Make me better, God. We were made to be together. Keep going. I need you, and you need me, and together we are better. Amen. I discovered that truth years ago when I was single. I was riding my bike through the streets of Vancouver, and I had only one thing on my mind. Her name was Rhea. And I couldn't for the life of me understand why I kept thinking about her. And I finally found her at 650 West Georgia Street, and she was standing up on a cement planter. And she had a blue and yellow cycling jersey on. And it was a blue sky day, and the blue sky was behind her in 650 West Georgia. And I looked at her, and you know what I thought? She has blue eyes. And that was it. And from that moment on, I knew that we would be better together. And you know what? We have been better together. Amen? Everything's better when we're together. And you know what? The same way that a young man finds a girl and a young girl finds a man and together their lives are intertwined. And, and you know when you're with the right person, you make each other better. That's one of the questions you ask young people as they're thinking about marriage. Do they make you better? Do you make her better? Does she bring out the best in you? Do you bring out the best in her? Why? Because when we're with the right person, it brings the best out in us. But I believe the same way that that works with a young couple, it works in the body of Christ. That God, in His divine plan, has established that we be connected with a particular body, in a particular place, in a particular way. Amen? You know, if God was only interested in getting us to heaven, He'd just take us there. You know what I'm talking about? Pray the prayer of salvation and woof, up you would go. We'd get six people in church, they'd get saved and they'd be gone. Because why? Because God was just interested in getting them to heaven. But He's interested in more than that. He's interested in after we come to salvation, after we come to know Him, He is interested in us working out our salvation so that His glory can be revealed in us. We discovered in that Scripture during communion that, that His glory comes on us when we are together as one. Why? Because in that process of connecting, in that process of learning to love one another, in that process of coming together, we get to work out our salvation. There are times when it's tough. I'm telling you, there are times when it's hard. But there are also times when it's amazingly good. Isn't, it, isn't that right? I remember one of those tough days that we had, and I actually, I actually went home and, and put all Rhea's stuff in a suitcase and put it on the porch. I'm done with this. I'm tired of working out my salvation with you because you're making it too difficult for me. Then I repented and asked God to show me what was wrong with me, and He did. You know, there are tough times and there are good times. Isn't that right? The good times usually come right after the tough times. It's called making up. Anyways, God puts us in a church. He puts us in a body so that we can grow and develop. Amen? So we're going to look at this a little bit today, what it means to love each other in the body of Christ. We'll start with Romans chapter 12, 5 and just review a little bit from last week and then we'll jump into today's message. Romans 12.5 tells us, since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other and each of us needs all of the others. Isn't that right? We belong to each other. You know what? I believe that God plants you in a local church and you just belong there. If we fight against that, if we struggle against that, you know what happens? We actually stunt and limit our spiritual growth. But if we submit to that and surrender to that and say, oh God, okay God, you've brought me to this church and I'm going to stay here until you tell me to go somewhere else. We plant ourselves. We let our roots go down deep. We build our relationships. We work on our issues. We get past the problems with people and we begin to grow and develop the character of Christ. And we learn how to love in very practical ways by someone sitting next to us who isn't easy to love. That's how it happens. You get to serve on a team with someone who's not that easy to serve with. Isn't that right? That's how love develops and grows. We all belong to each other and we all need each other. When we recognize that our spiritual growth and development in our life really depends on the people who are around us, 
That will really change how we relate to people. Amen? So we discovered this last week, that you cannot become all that God wants for you to become outside of the local church. If you pull yourself out of those local church relationships, if you allow yourself to be isolated or to be taken away for whatever reason, you will not become all that God wants you to become. And we discover that you cannot fulfill God's purpose for your life outside the local church. God has designed that in the local church we grow and we develop and we find our purpose in Him. The Bible says each part of the body supplies what the other part needs so that all the parts grow. Guys, it's better when we're together. You cannot be all you were meant to be. You cannot do all you were meant to do outside of the local church. Do you know what? We were made to love each other. And that's today's message. I was made to love you and you were made to love me. Guys, sorry, but you don't have a choice this morning. You have to love me. That's just the way it is. The Apostle Paul wrote these words to the church in Galatia. And I'll let you know a little bit of what happened here. Is This is a church that Paul planted. He planted this church and he established this church in the truth that we are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, not by works, lest anyone should boast. He wrote that to Ephesians. But he established this church built on the grace of Christ. Not by works. Not by legalistic. Not by following rules and regulations. So he establishes the church. He builds the church. And then he moves on to continue planting more churches. Eventually, Peter, one of the great leaders of the early church, comes to Galatia. And in Galatia, Peter really discovers the freedom of the grace of Christ. That we're not subject to the law. That we do not have to follow a whole list of rules and regulations to please God. Thank God! that we're free from that whole list. Thank God that we don't have to earn our salvation and earn our merit with Him, but we simply receive it by faith through Christ. So Peter begins to enjoy this freedom of grace. And then what happens is some Judaizers come in. These are people who want to follow Jesus, but they also want to put on people the regulations and rules of the law. And so these people come and they begin saying, hey, you know what? This grace isn't where it's at. You still need to obey the law. You still need to follow the rules of the law. So the membership class in the Galatians church went from, hey, we are saved by grace through faith. Thank God we're free. It went to this. All the men, come in this room, please. Now that you believe in Jesus, you have to be circumcised. Can you imagine the church membership class? Can you imagine bringing your friend to church and they get saved and you know that next week your friend is going to go to the membership class and the pastor is going to say, okay, everybody, have you been circumcised yet? If not, follow me into the back room. Don't worry, everything's clean. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. They went from the freedom of the grace of Christ and understanding that we please God when we believe in Him and trust Him to thinking that they had to follow the rules and the regulations of the law to have a faith that please God. Do you understand the picture I'm giving you? Two very, very different ideas. And Paul writes the book of Galatians really to attack this idea that we need to follow the rules and the regulations of the law in order to have a faith that pleases God. We simply please God by trusting in Him and simply following His Spirit. And so he comes down to the point of the point of the point in Galatians 5.6. And he says these words. He says, to the church in Galatia, he says, when it comes down to it, all that really matters, what matters most, the only thing that really matters is faith that makes you love others. If you want a life that pleases God, if you want a faith that pleases God, here's the bottom line. Your faith needs to make you love others. And if you can understand that, you'll please God. If you can have a faith that motivates you to love one another, You'll please God. You don't need to follow the rules of the law. You don't need to be circumcised. You don't need a list of rules and regulations and do's and don'ts to follow. You simply need faith that makes you love each other. And that's the point. Paul is saying the most important thing you can do as a believer, as a follower of Christ, is to allow His love to motivate you in your life. Let your faith stir you to love. 
It all comes down to this. If your faith doesn't produce love, then something's missing. What matters most is that you have faith that makes you love others. You may have all the spiritual gifts in the world. You may be able to preach circles around people. You may be a fantastic musician or a worship leader or a children's worker. You may be great at evangelizing your friends. But if your faith doesn't produce love, you're missing the most important thing. True followers of Christ are marked by their love for others. That's what it all boils down to. Everything we do needs to motivate us to love. Jesus said these words in the 13th chapter of John. He said, your love for one another will prove to the world you're my disciples. More than any other thing, more than the miracles. You know, we all want the miracles and the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right? We want the great big signs. We want the wonders. We want all of these things. But God says, really... What it boils down to is your ability to walk in love. Your ability to love the unlovely, to love the hurtful, to love the spiteful, to love those who are imperfect, to love those who are unlovely, to love those who are not easy to love. Your ability to love one another. You see, God doesn't always give us easy people to love. He gives us people to love that challenge us a little bit. He gives us people to love that are sometimes a little difficult to love. Because that's where real love develops. When we have to rely on God and say, God, I can't love this person without your help. I really need your help to love this person. Now you're talking training ground. Now you're talking developing character. Isn't that right? You know, there should be something different about our relationships in the church. It's not a social club. You know, we don't belong to some group or organization just for the sake of belonging to something. It's a body. It's a people planted and connected together to care for and love one another. People ought to look at church and think, what is it with those people? They're always doing something for each other. They're always reaching out. They're always making a difference. They're always helping. When someone's been away from the church for a while, they should be thinking, man, I really miss it. I miss the love that we had there. I miss those people. They really know how to love. The church should be a place where everyone is loved and accepted, where people are cared for, where our deepest needs can be met. The most beautiful picture of the church to me is when a wounded person comes in and over a period of a year and two years and three years, the wounds of their heart are healed and they're restored and they're whole again. Isn't that a wonderful picture of what the church should be and how it should be? We're to be a living expression of a loving God. I want you to think for a moment. When's the last time you did something for someone else just because? No motive, no agenda, nothing in return. You just did it because. Think about that. Not getting anything in return, just an opportunity to love someone. We should be able to think yesterday. Isn't that right? Jesus was asked this question. The religious leaders were trying to trap him. So they were devising different questions and different ways to try and to get at him and get him to say something that they could use against him in public. And one of the religious leaders, you know, thought maybe he could trap Jesus with the law. So he came to Jesus and, and it was a public setting in the synagogue, lots of people around, and he said, Jesus, what is the most important commandment in the Bible? And he was waiting for Jesus to say something that he could attack, right? And of course, Jesus' answer leaves everybody stunned because they don't know how to answer him. And when Jesus is asked that question, what's the most important? When you take all of the Old Testament Scriptures, all the books of the law, all of the prophets, when you read them all, add them all up, stack them all up, what is the one singular most important thing that you need to know and do? Out of all of the law, what is it, Jesus? And Jesus replies, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But Jesus doesn't stop with the question, does he? He carries on. 
He doesn't just ask, answer that question. He goes on and he makes a very important point. He says there's a second commandment that is equally as important as the first. Now notice Jesus' language. He doesn't say you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And while you're doing that, it would be good if you did this as well. He doesn't say that. He says here's the most important law. Love God with everything you have. Here's the second law. It's equal. Do you understand that? Jesus isn't saying this is the first and this is the second. He said the second one ranks with the first. It's just as important. And in fact, I believe Jesus is making the point that you can't do the first without doing the second. The first one requires the second one to happen in order to validate the first one. Watch this. The second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then He goes on to say, in fact, the entire law and prophets, everything that has been written and recorded from God from the beginning to today, all of it, all of it is based on these two commands. If you'll love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you'll fulfill the whole law of God. It's all the law of love, isn't that? Basically, everything we're told to do in the Bible comes down to these two things. Love God. Love others. But here's what I want us to see this morning. They're equal. You can't love God without also loving others. And the moment you hold hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, your love for God is diminished. Isn't that right? We can find all kinds of spiritual reasons Right for the hatred and the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the things that we say and the things that we do. We can cloak it and mask it in wonderful religious language and behavior, but if it isn't born of love, it isn't from God. And if it isn't born of love, your love for God is diminished to the degree that you hold that kind of behavior in your heart. Isn't that right? It's equally as important to love others as it is to love God. We learned that last week. You can't love God without loving your neighbor. You just can't do it. I was at a business years ago in town and two business owners were having a scrap, little scrap over something. And the one business person that I knew looked at me and said, I will never forgive so-and-so. And my heart just sank. But you have no idea the sentence you're declaring over your own life. When you utter those words, I will never forgive. We must forgive and we must love. If you develop a life of love, and it takes work, it's practical, it takes effort. If you develop a life of love, you will always please God. It's that simple. He leads us to love others. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2 challenges us. Live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered Himself as a sacrifice for us. A pleasing aroma to God. Our life should be filled with love for others and it should motivate our actions continually. Our life needs to be motivated by love for the people that God places in it. And our life should be marked by the sacrifice we make for others to show them God's love. You know, it takes a sacrifice sometimes. And sometimes you love people, you reach out and you love and you get a slap back. Isn't that right? You know, they just don't appreciate it. They just don't get it. They just don't... They, they just take it for granted. Or, or you give and you give and you give and then they just don't care and they move on. It's going to happen. But we've got to learn to love with nothing in return. I was talking to someone the other day and they said, you know what, I'm just done helping people. Every time I try to help someone, they don't appreciate it. And it was true. They were right. They, what they had done was wonderful and what the other person had done was horrible. They just didn't appreciate it. And I said, but you know what, you're a wonderful, caring person. And I know in my heart that you'll keep helping people. But you know what? I'll do it unto God. Because He sees it. And He will bless you and He will reward you. If you do it unto people, you'll be disappointed and discouraged. 
But if you do it as unto the Lord, you'll always receive the blessing. Amen? And there are times... There are times when you got to just keep on loving and keep on loving and keep on loving. Keep on giving and keep on giving and keep on giving. Amen. Let love be the motivation for all that we do. Amen. I want to give us five tips on how we can live in authentic, loving relationships. When we met as a church a few years ago and talked about some values that we wanted to guide us as a church, and we talked about all kinds of different ideas. Our young people in the youth group, as we met with them, said, you know, we want to have a church that builds authentic relationships where people actually stay and love each other long term. You know, I've got some friends here that have been with me through ups and downs and sideways and back and forth, and I just know that they love me. And I love them, and it's an amazing thing. And I believe these five simple things really should be the hallmark of our church. They should be what we're known for as a church. When people think about our church, they should think of these five things. And here they are. The first one is honor. When you love someone, you honor them. You don't talk down to a person that you love. You know what I'm talking about? In fact, I think of it this way. I just think we should look up to everyone because they are created in God's image. They are created in His likeness. They are His workmanship. They are His craftsmanship. And we ought to have that posture that we simply look up at people. That we honor them. Everyone that comes in the door should receive honor. Romans 12.10 tells us, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. The way we speak, the tone of our voice, the way we look, showing respect, treating people well, making room for them, always honoring people, always seeing what's best in them, always believing the best in them, always assuming the best in them. My wife told me this years ago, when you assume things about people, well, I won't get into that. Can't say that one in church. I just think we should assume the best. You, you know what it spells. Yes, anyways. Always assume the best. If somebody says something or you hear, well, I heard so-and-so did this, or I heard so-and-so said that. Always assume the best. Give them the benefit of the doubt. What good does it do to assume the worst? It just makes you feel bad for the rest of the day. But you'll feel better if you assume the best. Oh, she probably didn't mean that. Or, you know, somebody probably cut her off in traffic. Or, you know, the, her baby probably just threw up when I called her on the phone. Or, you know, assume the best. Assume maybe there's a reason. Maybe, maybe they didn't mean to not smile at you today. Maybe something was on their mind, right? Assume the best in people. And recognize what others do well and praise them for it. We need to be a church that just recognizes people and sees what they do and praises them for it. Sometimes we get all spiritual and we don't want to praise man because we don't want people to get proud. Well, I think that's just foolish. I think we need to praise people and build them up. I think we need to have positive things to say. Amen? Number two, forgiveness. We should be a church known for forgiveness. We should be people who are known for being able to forgive easily. And that, for some of us, could take a lot of work. Some of us have had hurts in our past that are very deep and they're very real. And it's very, very hard to forgive. So I'm not making light of that, but it's something we need to work on as a group of people is learning how to forgive quickly. Learning how to forgive easily. Not holding grudges. Not holding things against people, but being quick to forgive. Just learning how to let it go. Proverbs 19.11 tells us that a man's understanding makes him slow to anger. So, you know, sometimes you just got to stop for a minute. You want to answer. You want to say something. You want to just... But you have to stop. Take a breath. Right? Be slow to anger. And it goes on to say it's his honor to forgive. It's an honor to forgive. Do you know when you extend forgiveness to someone, you're not lowering yourself beneath that person. You're actually raising yourself up in honor. 
When you take the low road and forgive, it actually elevates you. Isn't that right? So learn to take the low road. The reality is, people will hurt you. And yes, people in the church will hurt you. They'll hurt you and they'll hurt me. We just have to accept that. We're all human. I'm going to do something next week that hurts someone. But I don't want to do that. It's not my goal. I'm not setting out with that intent. But I know that at some point I'll forget something or I'll miss something or I'll say something or I'll do something that will hurt someone. It's a reality. And if you'll be honest, you'll admit that you're going to hurt someone too. We're all going to do that. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all in the process of growth. And because of that, we all have that tendency to do things that hurt each other sometimes. But we need to learn how to forgive and overlook the faults of others. People are going to be people no matter where you go. So you might as well be in the church with the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God and work through these things together. Amen? Because as we work through them, we all get better together. Living a life of love means being able to forgive others when they are human. The same way that you would want forgiveness extended to you. Amen? Number three. We should be known for acceptance. If there's one thing I want people to feel when they come to church, I want them to feel accepted. I want them to feel like they're anticipated, like people are happy that they're here. And I hope you feel that from me because I am happy when you're here. We should be known as a place that accepts people, not as a place that criticizes or condemns or puts people down. You know, people are facing enough negativity out in the world already. They don't need to come to church and be barraged with another round of negativity. Isn't that right? They need to come to church where they can be loved and where they can be accepted, where they can experience God's life-changing grace and His Holy Spirit. That happens when we create an atmosphere where people are loved and accepted. I just want to say this. Acceptance is not the same as tolerance. You know, everyone in the world talks about tolerance right now. Tolerance means putting up with someone. If I tolerate Oakley, it means I don't really like him, but I'm putting up with him. He is the way he is, and that's the way he is, and I, just, I, I tolerate him. You know what? I don't want anyone to tolerate me, and I don't want to tolerate other people. I want people to accept me. You know, tolerance is completely different. Acceptance is powerful. People need to be accepted in whatever state they're in. Isn't that right? So often we get the process of salvation confused with the process of discipleship. Isn't that right? We want to accept people. We want them to receive the grace of God. People need to get God so they can get good. They don't need to get good so they can get God. You know what I'm saying? We need to make a place of acceptance where people are loved, where they can come in and feel the warmth and the love and the grace of God. You know what? As they receive the grace of God, a process of discipleship happens where they learn to follow God. Isn't that right? So often we get that first. We need to accept people. We need to accept each other's weaknesses. You know, some people do things that annoy us. We need to accept them, not tolerate them. We need to embrace them. People. Isn't that right? Romans 15, 7, Paul challenges us, accept one another then. There's going to be people different than you. They're going to think different than you. They're going to act different than you. They're going to do different than you. Paul says, let's accept one another just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. I actually like to read this in the Message Bible. So reach out and welcome one another to God's glory. That's the kind of church we want to reach out and welcome people to God's glory. Jesus did it. Now you do it. Amen? Number four, way that we learn to love each other. We need to be cheerleaders for one another. Amen? We need to lift each other up and cheer each other on, always looking for the best in others, 
always celebrating what they do well, always cheering people on. You know, the church is famous when somebody falls for giving them an extra kick. Isn't that right? Like, what's that all about? You know, you see a, a great leader who falls in the church and all the other church leaders start kicking him when he's down. I knew that guy was bad from the start. I knew, I, I, yeah, I never believed in his ministry. I, I, and they start kicking him. What's that all about? Why do we do that? Why do we point out each other's weaknesses and flaws rather than covering each other? When people are struggling, don't tear them down. Cheer them on. Amen? Don't focus on what they didn't do or shouldn't do or couldn't do, but what they can do. Focus on what they did do. Celebrate each other's success. Always look for the good and always cheer on the good. Always praise the good in each other. Amen? Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Not tear each other down, not put each other in their place, but lift each other up and push each other on in good works. Amen? And number five, believing the best in others. We should be known as a people who simply believe the best. You know what? One thing people need more than anything else, they need someone who believes in them. Isn't that true? How do you feel? Whatever endeavor you're going through, how do you feel when you know someone believes in you? Doesn't that just give you energy? Doesn't that just give you strength? Doesn't that just give you courage to carry on? Everybody needs to know that somebody believes in them. One of the greatest things you can do for a young person is simply believe in that young person. They might be messed up, mixed up, screwed up, doing everything wrong, making all kinds of mistakes, but when they know somebody believes in them, they'll get through it all. Amen? You've got to encourage that confidence. You've got to let people know that you believe in them. 1 Corinthians 13.7 says that love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love believes in others. And really it comes down to seeing someone else through God's eyes. How many of you know that when God looks at you, He doesn't see your sin? He doesn't see your weakness? He doesn't see all your past mistakes and flaws? He sees Jesus Christ in you. And He sees what you can be in the future. Isn't that right? That's how we need to learn to look at each other. Not at the mistakes and the flaws and the past and the failures, but rather to look at people and see Jesus Christ in them and see what they can become in Him. Amen? There's a story in the Old Testament where there's a man named Gideon and he's hiding out in the dark at night crushing a little bit of grain to make some flour for his family and he is timid and he is in fear. And he's hiding from the enemy, doing it at night. And the angel of God comes to him and says, oh, mighty man of valor. And Gideon's doing this. And he's like, oh, is somebody else here? Because <laughs> he can't be talking to me. Because he's chicken. He is afraid of everything, right? But God looks at him, this little, timid, fearful man, crushing some wheat at night in the dark, and says, you, mighty man of valor. He doesn't see Gideon for what he is. He sees him for what he's going to become. That's how we need to see people. Amen? God didn't look at what he was, but what he could be. Honor, forgiveness, acceptance, cheerleading, believing the best. That's how we need to be. That's how we need to live. That's how we need to love. And that's what should mark our church. A place where people are honored. A place where we forgive one another. A place where we accept people for who they are. A place where we cheer people on in their lives. And a place where we believe in others. Amen? Let's be connected to one another in life-giving relationships that are motivated by our faith and our love for God. What matters most is faith that makes us love. Does your faith make you love this morning? What matters most? Everything that you do in your life for God comes down to that. Faith that makes you love. Let's be people that love. Amen? We are better together and we were made for each other.